Okay, streaming. I'm gonna start sharing. Here we go. All right, you should be looking at our web page, yes? Okay, so I did a couple things um, earlier today. Um, one is to revise the syllabus that's printable. That's There's a PDF right here um, to be what actually happened <laughs> since break. I had revised it in, in planning on how to come back and then it got out of sync with what we were actually doing. So in case you ever need to show somebody um, you know, the syllabus from this class in, to take other classes or whatnot, um, the right version of what actually happened is now available. The other thing that I did was update when office hours are going to be next week. And I decided just to go crazy. Since I don't have to do class prep anymore, I've got a little bit of extra time. And so I'm having office hours every single afternoon next week. Because no one is going to fail either of my classes. That is that is my goal here. Everyone is going to, to do well. So um, each of the, both classes are going to be in the same hours. So there may be more or, or less people at a given time, but you are welcome to show up if you would like and work on your homework and pop in and out with questions if you want. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, several of you have not completed homework four yet. So just a reminder to make sure that you're trying to, to keep that stuff going on. I know you all have a lot of other commitments and things, but uh, I don't want have to fail anybody. Please don't make me fail any of you, okay? Deal? Right? Deal. Okay. Don't don't make me fail anyone this semester. It's life is too hard right now. Um Okay. We have and I apologize for this. Um, I think Terry, you had asked me like a week ago, like, what about the quiz? And I didn't understand what you were saying that I had totally forgotten that it was scheduled the week before. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, that's what happens when my classes get out of sync in terms of what we're doing. I just forget. Um, they had a quiz today. So now you have a quiz today. So thank you guys for doing that. Um, if you haven't done it yet, please make sure you do so, so I can give you your two points. But we can go over the answers for that. I read over the answers that were submitted um, uh, before 9 o'clock this morning. It looks like everybody did reasonably well on the first two questions. So in what situations or types of research questions is estimating multivariate models via path analysis going to be a better option than trying to trick univariate software? So what did you guys have to say? I'm watching the chat window eagerly, or you can unmute yourselves and talk. Your choice. Answers for number one here. Yes, when they when a given variable needs to be both a predictor with respect to other variables and an outcome at the same time. Yes, that's the big one. Um, I think it, it technically is possible to trick univariate software into doing that, but it's not worth the trouble. Um, at that point, you would be better off um, in a path analysis framework in particular because there's extra effects that are of interest in that situation, which are known as indirect effects, that um, like SAS estimate or Stata Lincom would not be able to give you. Um, Stata has a thing called NLCOM for nonlinear combination that will give those to you, and I'll demonstrate that today, but SAS doesn't have a way. So yeah, that would be the point at which I would um, eject from univariate software. Um, what else? I think a few of you had other answers besides that one. That's the big one, um, but there's a few other situations in which path model software would be more advantageous. Any others you can think of? What about generalized models? Kelly says dyadic data. Um, yeah, I think it, it depends on the model. Like in theory, if all you have are predictors and outcomes and one isn't necessarily both at the same time, then the, the regular software would be able to uh, handle that, so to speak. But if your predictors have missing data, then that would be a reason to switch to path model so that you could bring them into the likelihood. And then you would not have to toss cases that have missing predictors. So that would hold more generally, but I could see that being particularly useful in dyadic analysis. Another one was for generalized models. 
um, it is not possible, at least as, as near as I can tell, to ask for separate thresholds or intercepts in ordinal models. You can ask for one difference between DVs, but then it would assume proportional odds for all the others. Um, the same thing would be true about uh, scale factors in beta binomial or negative binomial models where you have that stretchy factor. It would constrain it to be the same across outcomes, and that's probably not a great idea, uh, without, at least not without testing it. And so path model software where each outcome really is a separate variable is going to offer you more flexibility in what type of conditional distribution would fit best for each. They don't all have to share the same one. Anything else on number one there that you can think of, or questions for that matter? Okay, checking my stream. Still streaming. Okay, can I get some yellow thumbs? Any questions? No, nobody's on camera today, so I'm feeling a little lonely. Oh, thank you, yellow thumbs. Okay, or what, whichever color thumb you decided to pick for yourself. I picked the palest one because on a good day, um, I look like a ghost. Let's see here. Number two. Everybody did really well on this one. We have a model and uh, total and model degrees of freedom. So here, here's an easy question. Do degrees of freedom have anything to do with number of persons in this context? No. Yes, thank you everybody. No, 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 no. What determines degrees of freedom? What do I need to know to be able to compute degrees of freedom, total or model? Outcomes, yeah. How many variables are in the likelihood? Um, because then it's a function of however many separate means, variances, and covariances among outcomes. In addition, the covariances of predictors that are not in the likelihood with outcomes that are in the likelihood also count towards uh, degrees of freedom. So in practice, because each variable that's in the likelihood ends up getting its own intercept and its own residual variance, the means and variances are going to be perfectly reproduced. There's just a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, where your degrees of freedom come from is going to be the number of direct relationships that have been omitted. So either between outcomes or of predictors with outcomes, those are the ones that matter. And so in order to have degrees of freedom that result in a testable model, which type of identification is that? Under, over, or just? So when is my model testable? Over-identified, under-identified, or just? We've got one vote for over, two votes for over. Yeah, yes, over-identified, yes. You have overlooked some paths, or you deliberately decided not to include them, whatever. Um, when not all possible direct relationships have been captured in some form or another, then your model is over-identified, which means you have degrees of freedom left to test how well it fits. I was going to say something and then I just lost it. Um, okay, here's here's a bonus question while we're doing some review. Is the model going to fit differently if a given arrow is pointing to the left versus if it's pointing to the right? Correct answers. Nope. Nope. In terms of fit, either a regression of one variable predicting another in one direction or the other, or a covariance between them. Any of those three is going to perfectly recreate the covariance between variables that exist in the data. So long as you've got one of those three, it's it's taken care of. Good. Um, and then the last question here. We had a, a, a few sources of confusion on this, and a few folks have got, got it right. Did we talk about fit really at all in the first half of this class? Like, we didn't talk about any of this, right? We had no, no, identification or, or testing model fit or none of that, right? What we concerned ourselves with was which predictors go in the model. So that's prediction, so to speak. Um, are their effects significant? And in terms of distributions, 
do we need to have a link function that controls what the scale of the predicted outcomes? So it needs to extend boundaries in that case. And what kind of conditional distribution matches, right? The closest we got to talking about fit would have been like which conditional distribution. But we didn't talk about degrees of freedom and over identification. So if I have just a regular old linear regression model, right? Normal residuals, quantitative outcome, and I've got three predictors. Is that model over identified, just identified, or under identified? I'm waiting. You can talk too, you don't have to uh, just type. Can we say it again? Certainly. If I have a regular old linear regression model and I have three predictors and I say the residuals are normal, so it's just a general linear model, is that model over identified, just identified, or under identified? One vote for just. Another vote for just. Yes, it is just identified. Because from the perspective of what goes into degrees of freedom, it's the outcomes, mean, variance, and covariance among outcomes. Well, if I have just one outcome, and it has an intercept, and it has a residual variance that's estimated, its mean and variance are going to be perfectly reproduced. In addition, for a predictor to be in a regression model, that means that it has a direct relationship with the outcome. So all possible covariances of the predictors with the outcome are in the model as regressions. It's just identified. It's perfect fit. So this fit is not a thing, right, in, in univariate analysis of any kind, in the same way that we worry about this model being over-identified. Where we first started to see that was in the context of multivariate models for multivariate normal outcomes, where we would have an R matrix that could be unstructured, say, or compound symmetry or compound symmetry, where we were trying to constrain variances to be equal to each other to save parameters or covariances to be equal. That is the first point at which fit became relevant. And you can do likelihood ratio tests of a saturated unstructured model versus some re more restricted version to see if the restricted version fits not worse. So I didn't use this identification language then, but this is the same idea. What I call unstructured when it refers to an R matrix is the same idea as a saturated model in path analysis. So that brings me to question three then. Is it possible to have a model that fits perfectly or nearly so and yet none of the paths be significant. Yep. In the same way that you can have a regression model that by definition fits perfectly, right, because it's just identified, that doesn't have significant predictors. So what good fit means, so either the model's over-identified and it fits not worse, than the saturated best model, or it's just identified and it fits perfectly. That just means that whatever pattern of covariances were in the data, your model has reproduced them. If your variables aren't related to each other, then none of the paths are going to be significant. But because you have adequately reproduced those non-relationships, fit is fine. So it's a distinction between model fit and effect size is what we're talking about here. Model fit is a prerequisite for examining effect size, because if your model doesn't fit, then the estimates for the paths are going to be biased to try and to, they're not going to be what they should be because they're trying to adapt to whatever misspecification you have as missing paths. So effect size is always relevant. It doesn't um, just because your model fits doesn't mean it's a useful model from a prediction standpoint. So all the things you learned about effect size in um, regression type analyses still hold in path models. We're just doing it for more than one outcome at a time. So each outcome is going to have its own R-square value, and we'll have um, effect sizes potentially for each individual path as a standardized path or a correlation. So. All right.
Any questions on any of those? Straws back. Okay, one happy yellow thumb. Any of that you want to hear again or hear differently? Okay, there's some more happy thumbs. Okay, all right. We'll, uh, we'll call it good then. I'll shut this thing down. So we've got um, a little bit left in 4B to do. I haven't talked through M plus code. So can I take a survey here? Um, those of you who are, who are planning on submitting your last homework, meaning you're not just trying to pass the class, but you're trying to get a good grade, um, are you going to be working in M plus or Stata? So how many of you um, plan on using M plus and need to learn it? Okay, counting one, two, three, four, M plus. Okay, it looks like it's about half and half based on the, my quick survey here. I may try M plus because I'm taking SEM in the fall. Yeah, um, that, that's a whole nother thing. Um, I'm still on the fence as to what I'm going to do in the fall because I want to use M plus, but the university has restrictions on how many people can use it at the same time, which means like if everybody's trying to do their homework at the same time, then there may not be enough licenses to go around. So um, I have to solve that problem this summer. Uh, all of the materials that I have are in M plus. Yeah, ooh, then Stata, yeah. Um, what may end up happening actually is I may switch to R because that's free and then I don't have to worry about access to stuff from off campus because that's the other issue with Stata is that the virtual desktop system does not have it. Um, so, but it looks like to answer my question for right now, um, several of you want to do M plus and so I will go over that. So I have open, let's see, that's 6A, I don't want that one. I have opened this one right here. Let's start here. This is example 4B part two. This is page 15. So we worked through, um, this is the example with the, the family data where we have a uh, kid, mom, and dad marital outcomes as our three outcome variables. We have each person's education as a predictor as well as the gender of the adult child. And last time we had gone through See an extra, sorry, distracted by an extra parenthesis here that I don't need. It's funny how I could spot typos even after I've been over this handout 8,000 times. Last time we went through model three, which said that dad's education could predict all of the outcomes, um, and each person's education could predict their own, but it didn't include the other paths, and that model was found not to fit as well as it should. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't up to standard. And it looks like it would be better if we allowed mom's education to also predict each person's outcome. So we're going to add those two paths. And so we have picked up these paths. The one of mom's education predicting dad's outcome in particular was what uh, was the source of misfit in the previous model. And I added it predicting kids for symmetry. So we have... Um, I have included in here what this model would look like in mixed because this is an instance in which all variables are either predictors or outcomes. So I have that for just uh, sort of continuity. And so sure enough, what's going to end up happening, just to spoil the surprise, is that there's a significant effect of mom's education on dad's outcomes. Um, it's a negative slope, which means in this case, as mom's education goes up, the level of conservatism in the attitudes goes down. So uh, as one might expect. So here's what the model looks like in Stata for path models. So my, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of typing here. Uh, my preference in showing uh, code for path models and also for structural equation models is to list out every single parameter that is being estimated explicitly. Um, so that, from that perspective, what I have here is way more typing than what you actually need. Um, I do this for pedagogical reasons, but I also do it to try and protect myself against changes in what the software defaults to. 
Um, M plus in particular has certain defaults where it does put in covariances between things sometimes by default and sometimes it doesn't depending on the exact version of the, the what the model looks like and so I've just gotten in the habit of putting in everything. So that's why it's somewhat overkill in this case. So for instance the first line here in Stata that is referring to the fixed intercept for each of the outcomes. You don't have to type that. That's estimated um, by default. What you do have to type are the regression paths. So which outcomes are predicted by which predictors? You have to specify that. And the direction of the arrows coincides to what it would be in a path diagram. The way that I've listed this is Y is first and then the arrow going into it, and then the predictors. So it follows the order of an equation where it would be like y equals all the x's. That's the order in which I've written these. Uh, Stata lets you reverse the order if you want, um, but for continuity with m plus, I didn't. So these are the paths that um, are being estimated in the model. And you can tell from this that kids' gender, not predicting the mom or dad's outcome, those are two of the paths that are missing, as well as kids' education, not predicting the mom or the dad outcomes, those are another two. So there's four paths that have been omitted in this model. Um, so we have four degrees of freedom with which to uh, be over-identified and test fit. Uh, in terms of typing, this line right here refers to the residual variances. You don't have to type that either. That is estimated by default. Uh, what you will have to type, though, are covariances between the residuals for the outcomes. And so this is would be a source of misfit if you omit this. Generally speaking, you would want all of your outcomes to have a covariance between them because they come from the same person. Um, I had done lincoms to get various com contrasts of the fixed effects. Those are exactly the same as what you already know how to do in Stata um, using any of the other uh, packages within Stata. Note the number of slashes here. So up until this point I had three slashes before each of the comments and then it switches to two. That's not a typo. The three means that it's a line continuation. So according to Stata, all of this up to this point is one line, is one command, where it wants you to list the paths first, then a single comma right here, then any covariances, and then the method of estimation. So this has two slashes here because it's not a line continuator, it's just a regular comment. So from this point on, it's reading each line separately. And so everything from this point has two slashes instead of three for that reason. OK, so I know we did state of code last time. Are there any questions from those of you who want to do that as, as to how to set up models? Or are we good? Radio silence. Good. Okay. I'm guessing you'll find out if you're good or not if you actually try to do it and it blows up at you. But um, in my experience, the hardest part of this was figuring out this pattern of when it's three versus two and when you need a comma and when you don't. It, to me, seems completely arbitrary. So just watch out for that as you're specifying things. Okay. Um, M plus. It looks like I do have to go back to model three because I didn't print it in here. So let me go backwards for just a moment here and do the top part of this. So I'm on page 12. So M plus has um, a very regimented structure. It is different than any other package that I know of in that a single file can only hold one model in it. So it's not like you can just type in lines of code and run just those lines to run one model at a time. The whole file is the model. That means you would have to comment out lines in order for it to include more than one model in the same script. 
So M plus has um, the syntax file ends in extension dot INP for input and the output that it generates is dot OUT for out output. Um, they're both text files. So um, you can open them in just a regular notepad, wordpad, whatever, and read them or refer to them as needed. So the M plus specific commands are in blue here. So these are recognized commands. Um, title is optional, but that's the, you can put a title on your output. For data, you have to tell it where your data is and what kind of data it is. Um, M plus only accepts data that are text files. So either a .dat extension or something that is delimited, like a comma separated values. Um, I highly recommend the latter because you can double click on it and it opens in Excel so you can check on it. So I use CSV files whenever possible. If you have um, this script, this .inp syntax file in the same physical folder as your data set, then all you have to do is list the name of the data set that it goes with it. So it's file equals and then the name of the data. If the data set resides in a different file, a different folder, excuse me, then you have to put the full path to it. So it would be just like in homework where you have file save and you have to tell it where your stuff is. That would have to be in here too. Um, I've just gotten in the habit of making sure that they're always in the same place because the files are so small. Um, it's not a problem to have multiple copies. Um, you can have free format or fixed format. Free format is much easier and you can read in individual data or matrices and so these two are defaults that we're assuming that's individual data. Okay. Under the variable column this is where you tell it what your variables are and what kinds there are. Now this is a common source of user error the names command right here. So you can use the words are or is or equal interchangeably. But names is where you tell it what the names of your variables are. So in most other programs that information is stored inside the data set. Um, M plus does not let you store the names with the data. So if your first row and your comma separated values file is the names, you will get an error. So you have to get rid of that first. Um, the names go right here. And each of them has to be eight characters or fewer. So it's very 1985 in terms of what, what are allowed for naming conventions. Uh, the good news is that it doesn't know what your variables used to be called. So if they were called something that was more than eight characters, it's just up to you to manually rename them. So for instance, um, you know, it was marital before, that would take up more than eight characters, and so I had to shorten it to merit in this case. So you have the names of the columns in the order in which they appear. So you, my advice to you in practice and using M plus would be to cut your data set down to just the essential variables that you need. That way you don't have to type out 7,000 names to go with all the variables. It's, it's kind of an antiquated system, but it is what it is. Use variables differentiates which variables are specifically in this model that you're fitting. If you don't tell it, it tries to put them all in. So note the difference here. I'm using all the variables with the exception of family ID. So that's the only one that's not being used because I don't actually need an ID variable in this analysis. It assumes that rows are independent unless you specify otherwise, which is the case here where we have wide data where each family is on its own row. You can tell it what your missing data code is. Um, it lets you have dots instead. I have had bad luck with that and so I always make sure that I have missing data values explicitly included. And so you can tell it here to disregard, for instance, anything that says minus 999 as a value. It treats it as missing internally. Um, okay, let me stop and pause there. Questions so far on M+. Terry's good. Yes. Yep, so in your homework, for instance, I gave you an Excel file. 
and Stata people can read in, I gave you a starter syntax to import the Excel file as usual, and I also included a line to get rid of the missing value codes. People who are going to take that Excel file and try and read it into M+, you have to convert it to a comma separated values file first and take out the names from the first row. Okay, other questions? All right. Um, analysis. These are options related to estimation and model type. Um, you won't be needing to change these, but you can have ML, which stands for full information, maximum likelihood. Uh, output options. These are extra things you want it to print that are not printed by default. So um, in case you hadn't picked it up, sorry, I didn't say this earlier, uh, comments are exclamation points. So it's a different than the other ones, but I've labeled what each of these does. So I'm asking for confidence intervals. Um, STDYX is the fully standardized solution. So that would be equivalent to z-scoring all variables in your model and then re-estimating the model. So it provides standardized slopes and covariances that turn into correlations, as well as r-square values for each of the outcome variables. Residual is the option that gives you the data estimated covariance matrix and the model predicted covariance matrix as well as a contrast of the two so that you can see which covariances are not being predicted accurately, which paths are missing um, that need that should have been there. And modification indices, this is the voodoo that you can ask for to help you improve the model. So all of this stays the same so long as the same variables are in your model. The model section down below here is where what you're asking for specifically would change. And so let me go to the previous model with mom's education in it that I started with to pick up from there. Here we go. So likewise, in um, M+, you do not have to ask it to estimate intercepts or residual variances. All you technically have to specify are the paths, what predicts what or what covaries with what. But for completeness, I'm writing everything down. The syntax structure. When you see a variable listed all by itself, what that is going to refer to is its variance. Um, an asterisk here means that something is estimated as opposed to an at sign, which means that it's going to be fixed to a certain value. Um, you don't technically need the stars, but I put them in here again for to be explicit about what we're ask, asking. So in this line, what this is referring to is the residual variance for each of my outcome variables. I want that to be model parameters. Um, the word with is how you specify covariances. So when you list a series of variables on one side, the word with, and then a series of variables on the other, it's going to give you all possible covariances between them. So you don't have to type them all out separately. M plus knows, based on your model, whether or not a covariance is a covariance, meaning that they're between predictors, or whether it is a residual covariance, meaning for the residuals after being predicted. Likewise, up here, where these refer to some kind of variance, it will be the variable's full variance if it's a predictor that's not being predicted. It will be the residual variance if it's an outcome that is being predicted. This right here is how you refer to a variable's intercept. It is a term that they, in brackets. So the brackets around it differentiate this line that's referring to its intercepts from this line up here without the brackets that's referring to its variances instead. Both of those two are estimated already for you. You don't have to write them if you don't want to. Then to get to the regressions, M plus does not allow arrows like Stata does, but it's the word on. So it's regress Y on X. So Y comes first on and then the predictors. So the way I think of it is that the on sign is like an equal sign where you're writing an equation 
So equations always have y on the left-hand side, so y on and then the list of predictors. And you can have as many outcomes or predictors on each side, just like you can in Stata. So for instance, this first line has one outcome, kid merit, and it has two predictors of it. Whereas this line right here has three outcomes being predicted simultaneously from dad's education. So you can stack it up so that you have all your y's on one side and all your x's on the other if all predictors predict each outcome. Okay, questions on that. So the on part is the part that you need to pay attention to where you'll be writing which predictors uh, predict which outcomes. Jinx good, okay. All right, the labels. All right. So, good. In Stata, you have to figure out what it names each of its predictors. And so it has a specific form where it's which equation it is and then which outcome and which predictor. And you can get that with an option called COEF legend. So I'll show you just up above here. Uh, this line right here prints a table that has the mapping of what Stata has named each parameter so that you can then refer to it to make it do math on it using LINCOM or NLCOM. So for instance, in these LINCOMs right here, like that word right there, that is what Stata called the, the predictor of dad's education on mom's marital status. That's its name for it. You cannot change this. At least I don't know how to change it. But, so once you have that table with the mapping, then you can go in and see what it's calling it so that you can then make it do math. M plus allows you to make your own labels. So in parentheses on these on statements, this is my user created name for what that regression slope is going to be named so that I can then refer to it later on and make it do math as if it were in an estimate or a LINCOM statement. So they go in order, and this is why I've written these the way that it is, because there's only one predictor here. I know that this predictor's effect on the first outcome, I named dad ed 2k, so that means dad's education to predicting the kid. That's the way I'm naming these things. This one is dad's education to the mom, and this is dad's education to the dad. These names can only be eight characters, so you have to get creative in your systems for naming things. And then down here, model constraint is a way to put constraints on parameters, but it's also a way to make new ones. And so this is analogous to a LINCOM or an estimate, where what I'm gonna do is ask it to do math using the estimated slopes that I have labeled up here. So for instance, if I want to know if the effect of dad's education differs in predicting the mom's outcome versus the kid's outcome. So I'm asking for a difference in two slopes across, of the same predictor across two outcomes. I create another name for what I want the new parameter to be called, and then I define how to get it. So the difference in the slope of dad's education in predicting mom versus kid, that name, that's what I'm asking it for, and then here's the formula by which it's going to make it. And so here are comments that explain what each of these things is doing. So it's the exact same idea as estimate or LINCOM. It's just a little bit convoluted because you have to name the new linear combination that you're asking for. But you can, but it works the same way as in any other linear model. So these are differences in slopes across outcomes just to demonstrate how I would do that. Okay, questions on any of the M plus syntax so far? One thumb up, two thumbs up, three thumbs up, I'm out of thumbs, four. Okay, we're good then. Well, stop me if you have questions and I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat window too to make sure I don't over talk anybody. Um, so M plus spits out fit first, in contrast to Stata that spits out parameters first. Um, it gives you 
the log likelihood for two models, the HO model and the H1 model. And my mnemonic, yes, you are the ho. You never, never, it'll always remember which one you are. Uh, HO is the log likelihood that goes with your model. H1 is the log likelihood that goes with the saturated model. So the model in which all possible parameters are estimated, all paths are in there. That's the best possible scenario. It'll be the, the, the highest possible log likelihood. Um, it also gives you AIC and BIC, which are statistics um, that you're used to from uh, the other sets of models as well. What it's calling the chi-square test of model fit refers to the difference in those log likelihoods. So the chi-square test of model fit is the likelihood ratio test. It's minus 2 times the difference of HO minus H1. It does that for you. So that works out to be a chi-square of 1. The degrees of freedom for the chi-square are the number of over-identified parameters, so the number of paths you left out, and there are four here, and a chi-square of 1 on 4 degrees of freedom, very non-significant. And in this case, the p-value for non-significance is exactly what we want. What that's telling us is that our HO model has sufficiently recreated the pattern of covariance that's in the perfect model H1. So it is not significantly worse, meaning the four things we left out, they're close enough to zero that we don't need them. So we have good fit. That means that we can proceed with actually interpreting parameters. The rest of the fit statistics then are referring to a contrast of either the saturated model with our model or to the null model with uh, the saturated model or our model. So RMSEA, for instance, uh, this one is one that you want to be as small as possible. Less than 0.05 would be preferable. Uh, that was zero in this case. Uh, CFI and TLI are indices of fit. You want them to be as high as possible. And they're both uh, one in this case. Uh, it gives you one more chi-square test. You can ignore this. The only thing that that chi-square test is telling you is how the null model that has no covariances in it compares to the saturated model. Neither of those is your model, though. What it's really saying is whether or not there's any covariance worth modeling. If, uh, if that's non-significant, then basically game over, don't even bother. You have no relationships in your data. I've never seen that happen in practice. And this is one more error-based model where we want it to be as small as possible. Stata doesn't give you this one, I found out, if you have missing data. So. In terms of the solution, M plus lists the estimated parameters in its own particular order. They're not in the order in which you wrote them. This drives me nuts. But first is going to be any of the ONs. So these are the regression paths where it's outcome on predictor. So for instance, this one right here, the first column is the slope for how the gender of the adult child predicts the adult child's marital attitudes. So uh, boys are more conservative than girls. The estimate is here. Uh, its standard error is the next column over. Estimate over standard error, that's your wall test. That's going to be treated as a Z because there's no denominator degrees of freedom. And here's the exact p-value that goes with that Z. Um, and then here's my notation on the side for which parameter this would be in the equation up above. The widths then come next. Those are your residual covariances. So this is the unstandardized solution in which everything is being predicted using the original units of the variables. So it's, it's, it's unit specific. So these are covariances. Next come the intercepts. Those are always the expected outcome when your predictors are zero. That hasn't changed. Here are the residual variances. So this is the amount of variation left over in each outcome. And then last, the new additional parameters, those are any of the linear combinations that you asked for specifically. And it only lists the name that you provided for them. So hopefully your naming system will be sufficient for you to recreate what you did. That's always a little bit tricky. 
um, in the standardized solution then. So this is the other solution in which everything has been z-scored so that um, these paths are the same thing as standardized slopes in regression. They're the unique relationships, um, but they are fully standardized. So the nice thing about these standardized paths is that they are all on the same scale, so you can compare them and see which predictors have relatively stronger effects. Um, so for instance, gender has a bigger effect than education on this outcome, just looking at the size of this coefficient. So all of these standardized slopes show up with the ons, and then the widths. So <laughs> more question. The widths in the standardized solution give you residual correlations instead of covariances. So what would be in R core in SAS or SSTAT W correlation in Stata, as I recall. Um, standardized intercepts uh, tend not to be super helpful. Uh, residual variances. These, this is in the standardized solution. What's more useful than that is here are your R square values. So I'm asking for these in homework as well. They come from the standardized solution. So in terms of how well the model did, this is effect size. So we know that the model fits. We know that the four paths that aren't in here don't need to be there. They're close enough to zero that, that leaving them out is fine. Um, but how well did the model do in a more absolute sense is given by these. So for instance, kid marital attitudes, the model predicted about 6% of its variance. Not great. Um, mom marital attitudes, uh, less than 2%, so even not greater. Um, and dad marital attitudes, much higher, so 12%. So it looks like in this model, the only thing that's predicting dad's marital attitudes is education of the mom and the dad, but it has a much rel relatively bigger role in predicting dad's attitudes than mom's or kids. So this is your measure of effect size for how well the model predicts overall, um, how, how each individual predictor contributes to that would be given by the standardized solution for the specific regression paths, the slopes themselves. So path and slope are the same thing, by the way. Um, in this context, I just start saying path automatically, but it's a slope. That's what it means. Um, here's the residuals for the covariances. And so this is your troubleshooting info. This is how far off the remaining ones are. They're very close to zero, which means that uh, this is just reiterating the fact that our model fits uh, because the covariances discrepancy between the data and the model are very small, which is what we want them to be. These are the ones that are left outside that we didn't fit. And then here's my results section, and here's a picture of the model itself. So, all right, questions on any of that? Welcome to M+. Plus. Okay, no questions? Do you feel like you could do this yet? Your homework is a fairly complex path model um, because it has more variables, but it is uh, well within your capabilities, I think. We're kind of. Trial and error, yes, going to try. That's all I can ask. Going to try is, is, the, is the correct answer. So it'll be the, the same as usual. If you get the right log likelihood, you've got the right model. So you'll know that you've got all the paths in that you need if you get that magic one correct. Uh, the only thing that's different that we haven't talked about yet is this concept of what happens in path models when a variable is both the predictor and an outcome at the same time. In that situation, there is a special set of vocabulary that comes into play that's known as mediation. So I'd like to uh, switch gears and start talking about that, if that's all right with you guys. I'll shut this one. Actually, let me save it. I'll shut that one down. You ready for some mediation? We're going back to lecture six. I am picking up in lecture six on slide 39. Mediation and moderation. Um, so 
going to be honest with you guys, there is a whole lot of marketing that goes into these terms that is sort of unnecessary. Um, moderation is the idea of interaction terms. It's just a fancier word that means interaction term. The idea that the effect of a predictor depends on a value of another predictor. Um, mediation is regression with a much better marketing campaign behind it. Mediation is a thing. Um, to me, it's sort of silly because it's not any different than what you would typically ask for in, re in a regression setting. Mediation is basically the idea, after controlling for some other variable, does X still predict Y? That's just a, a standard regression question, but there's extra steps and pieces of information and vocabulary that go along with it. So I want to make sure that you guys are conversant in mediation so that you can play along with that game. So up here on slide 39, the top half here, this is your classic mediation triangle. Um, X on the left predicts a variable that is known as a mediator, and the mediator in turn predicts Y. So the logic here is sort of causal. Um, for instance, if I have a study that's designed to help children have better outcomes by equipping their parents with the necessary skills they need to be better parents, right? If I had something like that, then X would be like a treatment group versus control, something like that. Um, the mediator would be parent outcomes. So if the training is, is successful, the parents improve. And then M to Y would be something like, well, if the parents improve, then their kids improve. And so the extent to which training is helpful for the kids depends on whether or not training helped the parents who then helped the kids. That's the logic here. So a mediator is always supposed to be some kind of causal agent. Um, it's commonly confused, though, with the term moderator, which is not the same thing. Um, a moderator picture is shown right here, the second set here. Um, this is a common shortcut in drawing path models that people use, but this is not a model. What is actually implied by this picture right here is what's the third picture down here, where I have X as a predictor, M as a moderator, and then X by M the interaction term is the formal test of moderation. So the both main effects of X and M are included. X by M then is the extent to which the effect of X depends on M or the extent to which the effect of M depends on X. You can spin it either way. Um, so moderators are often things that are individual characteristics uh, like age or gender or uh, things that differentiate people that would have been there to begin with. Um, so let me quiz you. Could I have something like age as a mediator? Do you think that seems like a reasonable idea? No with a question mark from the audience. Anyone else want to weigh in? Could age be a mediator? Only one vote so far. Another vote for no? I don't think so with a question mark. Yeah, I know you're, you're afraid to, uh, to make a definitive stance, but yes, age is not a mediator. For that to make sense, you would have to have, like, treatment causes age, and age in turn causes something else. To the best of my knowledge, the only thing that can cause age is a calendar age cannot be a mediator. Age can be a moderator though. Um, do you think the effect of treatment is different for older people than younger people? Sure, that's a reasonable question, but that's a moderator question, not a mediator question. So getting the words right is really important because it implies a very different model if you say something is a moderator versus a mediator. So we've talked about moderation to death. I've I have uh, bludgeoned you with interaction terms for like a year now for some of you. Um, so we're talking about mediation, which is something different. So we're focusing on this idea up here. Okay, 
How are we doing so far? Okay. Good. So mediation. Some words. So common terminology in describing mediation and effects that pertain to it. The original question would be, you know, does X predict Y? That, that path, that slope, is going to be labeled as the C path. Does X still predict Y after controlling for M? That's the basic question of mediation. The path from X to M as the mediator is labeled as an A path. The path from M to Y is labeled as a B path. And the C path here has a um, apostrophe, uh, prime, I don't know what you want to call it. Let's go C prime. That reminds me of math. Uh, Lexi, can I get a judge's ruling? C prime? She's my undergrad math major. No? Okay, a judge's ruling from anyone else. Can I call this C prime? Is that right? Hello? Yes, I think so. Pretty sure that's right. Okay. Matt, it's been a long time since I was in math. I got to be honest. But that C apostrophe, I think I can call that C prime. So the question is whether or not the red C over here, the unconditional C before you control for the mediator, is different than C prime, the result after controlling for the mediator. That's the big question. It's just a regular regression question once you strip away all of the extra marketing around it. Um, it works out that in most circumstances, there, there's probably exceptions to this, but whether or not the C path is different than the C prime path is the same thing as asking whether or not the A slope multiplied by the B slope is significant. So this is a very specific term. The A slope multiplied by the B slope is what's known as an indirect effect. It describes how X gets to Y through this other variable. And if the indirect effect of A times B is significant, then the C slope is different before you control for M versus after. So the way that people oft most often test then whether or not the C slope differs before or after controlling for the mediator is by looking at the indirect effect, its, its estimate, its confidence interval, and its standard error. So this is the thing that you can't do as easily in univariate software that you can do quite easily in path analysis software because you can ask for a new parameter that is a nonlinear combination. You can literally ask it to multiply the slope for A times the slope for B and it will spit out a standard error and it will spit out a p-value that goes with that test. Um, it's NLCOM and STATA, and it's just another model constraint with a new NM+. So once upon a time, in models of mediation, there were a set of rules that were put in one paper and just like universally adopted. The classic uh, reference for this is Barron and Kenny. It's the Journal of Social Psychology, Personality and Social Psychology in 1986. This paper has had like like 100,000 citations or something. I'm not even kidding. It is like the, the reference. Um, and so because it's so entrenched, particularly in, in fields like social psychology, there are a lot of people who think that they're, those rules are the rules. And if, you, if they don't play by the rules, then you can't do this. But um, more recent work has shown that those, some of those rules can be broken. So it used to be the case that the relationship between X and Y had to initially be significant. Otherwise, game over, you can't test mediation. That is not true. Um, it is possible that you could have an initial relationship be non-significant and that it turns significant. It could be zero and then it turns positive. It could start out positive and turn negative. It could start out negative and turn to zero. The, the key question is whether or not the relationship has changed whether or not C is different than C prime. So C doesn't have to be significant necessarily to have changed after controlling for the mediator. 
um, arguably the first other rules still have to hold. It doesn't make sense to talk about an indirect effect of A and B if those paths are not significant. So if X doesn't predict the mediator, it's hard to argue that that could be the reason why X and Y are related. And I say pry, meaning probably, because this is something that um, I think is, you could make an argument for it in limited cases, but it would, it would be an uphill battle. So A and B probably should be significant for you to start talking about indirect effects or mediation. C and C prime don't necessarily have to be. Um, but the old language that goes along with this is that if you had a significant C relationship and after controlling for the mediator it became non-significant, then that would be full mediation. If you had a significant C relationship and after controlling for the mediator, it was still significant, but it was smaller, the, the indirect effect was significant, um, then it would be partial mediation. So you may still see those terms floating around. That's sort of an antiquated way of talking about it because it's a very much dichotomous thing. Um, okay, let me pause, sip my soda. Questions? Is mediation something that's mentioned in the articles that you guys read? Kelly says yes. Anyone else? Jeff, yes. Terry, yes. Yeah, it's it's a it's a thing. Like mediation is a thing. Um, it it's just regression, folks. It's it's a marketing campaign. But I want you to be able to play this ball game because it is so prevalent. Um, so if you were looking at this type of analysis through the lens of regression, right? If you didn't know path modeling, all you knew how to do was regression. Um, what you would have to do is fit a bunch of different models. You'd have to fit a model for just X predicting Y, another model for X predicting M, another model for M predicting Y with X in it to get all of these pieces of information. and so sort of the, the old school way of doing that from that univariate sequential model perspective is all about how do you combine the standard errors across different analyses to be able to figure out the significance of the indirect effect. So here's a formula that you could use to do that. And this is how I think the uh, programs like there's a forget what it's called, an SBSS program process, I think a macro or whatever, there's code by which you can do path models as different regression models um, and you can get indirect effects. It's just kludgy and you can, um, it makes it hard to test multiple mediators or to show differential mediation across groups or anything like that. So it is possible to do um, mediation tests through separate regression models, it's just not ideal. But this, um, this formula right here to get a standard error for the indirect effect, which is the, the question, that's what's known as the Sobel test. You can do it by hand, and that's what's provided for the p-value that shows up in M+, plus, for instance. If you literally just ask it to multiply A times B and make a new parameter, it gives you a standard error for that, and that works out to be the same thing as this, um, within rounding error, of course. Um, here's the thing, though. Whenever you have two variables that are supposed to be normally distributed, so like the sampling distribution of each of these slopes in theory should be normal, centered at zero is the null hypothesis, their multiplication is going to create a variable that's non-normal. And so here's just some pictures trying to demonstrate what the distribution is across samples of the AB indirect effect given uh, these distributions for each of its direct paths. Um, and so because the resulting distribution, sampling distribution of the AB indirect effect is non-normal, just having a standard error and doing your regular, you know, two standard errors on either side, like test for it, is not going to be um, as accurate as something else. And so this is where there is a whole lot of research that's been done, say, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, to be honest, this bores the shit out of me. Um, I'll just be honest with you. Um, but because reviewer three is going to be like, you can't just use the p-value, you have to do bootstrapping. 
I will tell you about that. Um, so the best way to find a confidence interval and a p-value for an indirect effect. Uh oh, unstable. I froze. Okay, I'm come. I'm waiting. I'm back. You back. All right. Okay. Did you hear the part where I said this is boring? <laughs> yeah. The universe is punishing me. Yeah. No. I. To be honest, all the different ways of doing bootstrapping to get standard errors and p-values for indirect effects. It's like, oh my god. Um. In practice, I've only seen it differ in the third decimal place. Like, I just, I just can't. Um. It's one of those things that I'm gonna leave it to someone else to care about because I don't have room. But reviewer three is going to insist on this. I can guarantee it. So um, I would say the most optimal way to get the rightest versions of this is to do bootstrapping. In M+, that's one more option. You just ask for bootstrap standard errors. Um, in Stata, there's an option VCE bootstrap that you can do this. Um, that's in all of the, the different procedures, but it shows up as in this case in particular. Um, what bootstrapping is, is resampling from your data with replacement. So what, what would happen is that it draws samples from your real data, like one, it draws one new sample of so many cases, runs the model, gets your A and B, does it again, does it again, does it again. So then you have this empirical sampling distribution rather than a theoretical one that you can get your confidence limits from and your standard error as the average distance of any one replication from the population mean. So it takes just a few more seconds to do this, and then Reviewer 3 will be happy with you. Uh, there, people have hacked the bootstrap to try and make it even better with various options. Uh, the last time I bothered to do any reading about this, it was the bias corrected bootstrap that is now recommended. That's BC bootstrap and M plus. Um, I couldn't find any documentation in Stata that said which kind of bootstrapping it was, so I think it's just regular flavor, but it's possible that that's changed in, in more recent versions. Um, the only catch is that the only time that you can ask it to do this bootstrapping of your data for you is if all of your um, mediation variables are multivariate normal. It won't do it otherwise. So it won't do it for generalized models, it won't do it for multi-level multi models. Um, in that case, what you can do is draft the estimates themselves. Um, and so you would pretend like you know what the sampling distribution is given the standard errors of each of these things and ask an, something to draw from it. And I have a shout out here to Chris Preacher's website. He's sort of like the mediation king. Um, and he has um, online calculators that you can plug your data into in terms of what A and B are and all the related standard errors. And it can do the, re the, the bootstrap resampling of those parameters themselves, even if you can't do it in your data. So uh, long story short, the, when you're testing indirect effects, people are going to ask for extra levels of certainty regarding those p-values that you would not normally see because the sampling distribution of an indirect effect is not going to be normal most of the time, like it would, would, would be for a regular direct effect. So by the way, note the change in the language. <laughs> what I started out at the beginning of the semest semester saying slope, uh, last week slope became path, <laughs> and now in this context, a path is a direct effect. So all three of those words mean the same thing. The indirect effect is the multiplication of two direct effects from x to m and from m to y. All right, what time is it? It's time to go. How about that? I must have I must have sensed it. So this would be a good stopping point. We can look at example say mediation and indirect effects um, next time, and that will be I guess the one little part of your homework that you don't know how to do yet. But otherwise, you can get started on it and see how it goes. So any questions before we call it a day? No questions yet? Okay. Well, office hours start now. Let me, let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, I hope to 